morning, everyone, and welcome to our Riverside Community Church. Uh, it's a beautiful day today. I live up in the wilderness, and uh, Sunday today I drove down, saw the lake, woods. It was a beautiful day today, a great Lord's Day. We are gathered here today to worship and give thanks to our Lord and Savior. Let us begin by centering ourselves and preparing our hearts for worship today. Um, I want to, as we come together today, let us remember the words of the psalmist who said, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Let us join together in praise and thanksgiving. Let us stand for worship. the 
Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise forever to the praise and honor and glory unto you. Lord, we ask that your spirit open our hearts now as we lift up our voices and sing these words to you. We ask that your name, only your name be lifted on high. Be in the midst of us, Lord God, work within us, minister to us, Holy Spirit. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's put our hands together and worship God.
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name declare this morning as one body of Christ as one church together there is power in your name and there's nothing that could stand against this name the name that you have given us Jesus oh God we thank you so much that you have given your son Jesus for us that all of us standing in this room before your presence that we were not worthy but only through the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we stand before your presence. Amen. 
Oh, how amazing your grace is. We praise you, God. Lord, as we press in this worship service now, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us in every aspect of our worship, that everything would be centered on you, God. Everything would be glorifying unto you. We thank you for this time of praise. We love you, God. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Amen, amen. Yeah, now we're in a right state of mind for our church today. Uh, we have some announcements for you. I uh, just want to say hello to each other, uh, greet each other, and say happy Sunday today. It's the Lord's Day. It's a beautiful day today, actually. Um, just an announcement for our house churches. Oh, I should do this. Maybe you don't know this. Uh, just for our house churches today, this is really the lifeblood of our church, uh, Riverside Community Church. Uh, if you're not plugged into our house church, please do so. We've been reminding everyone each and every week. So uh, if you're not in or if you are in a house church, uh, please keep going at it. And please just keep up the spirit and keep up on going. Uh, house church, take part. Uh, they're, they're given gathering twice a month for food, fellowship, and Bible study. Uh, really, join one today, and all are welcome. Please contact uh, Yoon Choi, Helen Park, or Esther uh, for some more information. Uh, there is also announcements for a praise request, too. Uh, as you can see, we have our praise. It was great stuff, but most of them are youth, and they have to go downstairs, <laughs> too. So we need some praise people. If anyone has any inclination of music, of singing, or so even maybe if you don't, you can learn too. So uh, we encourage anyone who has any um, aptitude to do so or the will to do so to uh, possibly join the praise team if it's, if it's an announcement. Uh, the windows, have you guys seen? The windows project is done. Let the light shine in, right? It's beautiful. Uh, the windows are, it's almost too bright sometimes in, in the fellowship hall. Uh, and that's gone. So please turn down. But uh, thank you for that, and thank you for all the hard work there, too. And uh, it was a, a project that I think was about 10 years in the coming or so. So I want to thank you. Right? About 10 years <laughs> or so in the coming. So uh, I want to thank you all and thank you for all the efforts. Uh, we do have our men's golf outing. Uh, this is our first time that we're doing it over at Architects Golf Club over in Lopechang, New Jersey. Uh, really, if you want to participate, please contact Tong Park. As we uh, have a day of fellowship with the men. As a reminder, also, we have our summer retreat that is coming. Uh, please mark the date for that. It's August 11th through the 13th. It, the location's at Spruce Lake Retreat Center uh, in, in Pennsylvania there. Please contact Helen Park for questions and information about that. and fellowship food. Good morning, Clay. Um, Clay's announcements, we have uh, next week going, oh, this coming up Friday, we have uh, Mother's Day flower prep, as we do always every year. So please come by 8 o'clock to uh, prepare Mother's Day flowers. If you love your mom, you will come, right? Amen? I guess not. Uh, clay worship, moving right along here, clay worship service, uh, we're going back down to uh, clay worship next Sunday, so please join us at 11 a.m. in the clay room downstairs. Next announcement, we have Captain Jimmy, uh, Monday picnic with Captain Jimmy. Um, it's going to be, the location has been uh, decided, it's set, we have the permit, we'll be going to Vanson Park, uh, picnic area A, okay, lot A. Um, more details will be shared that that week uh, through the uh, weekly email update. So please, please uh, make sure you check that out. Any uh, questions, and if you're not getting any of the email updates, please let me know or let your teachers know, okay? Um, oh, and then another thing, we need to know uh, if you're coming or not, okay? So please uh, speak to your teachers or to me because we're preparing food, awesome 
food. Uh, uh, we're going to barbecue out there. So pray for good weather. So we need uh, a good head count. So please let me know uh, ASAP. Um, so this coming up uh, Saturday uh, is the uh, Princeton Volleyball Tournament. Now, I actually delegated and uh, asked uh, Isaiah, our uh, dear brother Isaiah, to kind of uh, arrange this. So we have a group chat, and I believe he asked if anyone's interested. Only two people. Uh, and, uh, and I told them we need two girls because it's a co-ed, uh, co-ed league. And so if you're uh, clay girls in the house and you like to, you know, you like to participate, please speak to Isaiah today, okay? Please speak to Isaiah and that, uh, that way we could uh, sign us up uh, this coming up week, okay? Uh, clay May calendar is out, so make sure uh, you check out your email update once again. Uh, and then we have Bible study after today's worship service. So please go to your respective uh, Bible study locations. I'm doing double duties today. Let us bow our heads as we give uh, a prayer to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you the glory and the honor for all that you're doing in our lives every day. Even in the times we can't see it or understand your ways, Heavenly Father. Shine your light in us, through us, over us. Make, may we make a difference in this world for your glory and purpose, Heavenly Father. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We thank you that you own it all and hold everything in your hands. We thank you that you know our needs before you even ask. You're always of all, you're aware of all that concerns us, and you have a plan for and provision. You alone can move mountains and make a way for your children. We ask for your answers in your timing for every need that weighs our hearts down. Heavenly Father, uh, this year marks a crossroads at uh, Riverside Community Church, Father. Lord willing, be with us as we create a loving biblical community that touches every person at RCC, then to then touch those in our communities, our school, our workplace, and all around the world, Heavenly Father. Let's just let it get viral today. Um, let, us, let this be a marking point where we as a congregation can be an example of what Christ stood for. More specifically, let our youth be touched by your direction, Heavenly Father. Please be with them as they navigate the trials of young adulthood. Help them frame their outlook with all the teachings and love that you have bestowed upon them. And let your, our youth have their receptive and open heart to your new path. Likewise, Lord, please guide the parents to be a loving follower of your word. Do so, doing so will guide them to deal with family issues in, their, in a Christian manner where patience and perseverance to follow the path that Christ mapped out for us. Heavenly Father, in this uh, bit of sad time, uh, not, not bit, but uh, we lift up Ben and his family to you during this uh, difficult time of their father's uh, Arthur's accident, Heavenly Father. We know that uh, you are a God of mercy and compassion. And we ask that you would surround them, that family, with your love and peace, Heavenly Father. We pray for strength and comfort for their family who are facing such, a gra such grave circumstances. And we ask that you would pour out your grace upon them that you would, and that they would experience your presence in a powerful way. Heavenly Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to be inspired by the saving grace of the work done on the cross. Really, Heavenly Father, let us challenge your everlasting gift of redemption towards us bearing good fruits. Whether, by, whether it be by giving our times toward uh, building, volunteering for the many activities of our church, whatever fashion you see fit, Heavenly Father. Lord, Heavenly Father, please bless Pastor Richard as he delivering your message today. Lord, please be with Pastor Son as he delivers communion today too. Inspire our teachers, staff, deacons, and elders to be faithful servants and practice your word throughout the week. Father, we thank you for the offering that was received. Bless it that it may be used for the benefit of your kingdom. We pray for direction and guidance for its use, and let, it, let us be good store, stewards over your finances. We come to give you thanks and offering. Please let it not be wasted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We've been going through a series on Habakkuk. Is this new? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh. Nice. Wonderful. Um, sorry. Uh, we've been going through a series on Habakkuk, and this is the last uh, concluding sermon on the series. 
And uh, I'd encourage you that if you um, weren't here for any parts of the previous messages, to go and take a look on, on, the, on the website or on YouTube uh, to be able to kind of sort of get the full picture of Habakkuk. Now, you'll remember Habakkuk is a minor prophet in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, these minor prophet books were typically, uh, a prophet is one who speaks for God. So a prophet was one who would receive a, a word from God and then deliver it to the people. God wants to speak a message to his people, and he would use it through the prophets to communicate to the people. And so most minor prophets are the articulation of the writing down of God's message to the people. Habakkuk's actually a little bit different. Uh, Habakkuk is actually a little bit more like a journal entry between Habakkuk and God. It's a conversation between God and Habakkuk. And what is this conversation about? Well, Habakkuk is complaining about the, the injustice and oppression and the violence that he sees amongst the Israelites. Jack, I feel like the microphone's just a little loud, if we could just turn it down a little bit. Um, so uh, Habakkuk is complaining about all the injustice that he sees amongst the Israelites. And he's saying, God, there's, this, there's so much injustice going on in our society. Won't you uh, respond? Won't you show up? Won't you make this better? And God says, yes, I will. And if you've been tracking with us, you remember that God says, I'm going to send the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians were sort of the sworn enemy of the Jews. And in fact, this uh, answer to prayer in Habakkuk actually leads to the Babylonian exile where the Jews are basically scattered all throughout uh, from their land. So they, they, the Babylonians come in and actually sweep them off of their land. And so you'd be wondering if you're Habakkuk or if you're reading it saying, well, why would God do this? How is sending someone who is more vicious, more wicked, more unrighteous to be the one to deliver them from their existing injustice? That doesn't seem to make sense. That doesn't seem to be how God would want to work. And so we see this interaction between Habakkuk and God. And where God says to him, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to trust me and wait for the revelation to be done. And so Habakkuk is understanding this positioning between him and God. How things may not always get better before they get worse. And we looked at this idea of the dip, right? Taking from Seth Godin's book in the dip, right? And so this trace of how things and stories progress throughout scripture oftentimes follow this pattern. Whether it's the, the Jews being led out of, uh, uh, out of Egypt and being faced with the Red Sea. Whether it's the disciples uh, following Jesus and then reaching a critical point in Jesus's ministry where they're deciding whether to continue to follow Jesus or not. Or whether it's Jesus on the night you know, in Gethsemane where he's saying, I don't want to drink this cup, but I will follow your will. We reach this point where things are going and progressing, but then things begin to slide. Things begin to get worse before they get better. And you reach this crisis point where we want to either give up or just go back to the way things were. You may have experienced this personally. You may have be experiencing this as a church. There are all types of situations where in your career or in your marriage or in your parenting, you may feel this moment of crisis. But God invites us to go through the dip, to go into the crucible of his faith-building fire to build up our trust, to remember that in those moments of crisis, we have no other alternative but to rely upon God. And what ends up happening is, in each of those stories in the Bible, we see how God brings the victory at the other side. God is the one who delivers the Egyptians, uh, the Israelites from the Egyptians. God is the one who delivers the, the, the uh, disciples from their doubt. God is the one who raises Jesus from the dead, even despite the crucifixion. And so we see that this is the type of God that we serve. So this is a reminder for us that not just wrestling through our doubts, but wading through the dip as well. And so now we come to the concluding chapter of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, and it starts out like this. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet 
on Shigenath, which is just a musical term. It says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and, sorry, and uh, his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. And so this is Habakkuk's prayer, which is actually a song, right? So this is actually an act of worship. Habakkuk is responding in song to God. And what he's doing is he's saying, I remember what you've done. You have shown me what you have done. God, don't you remember all of these wonderful things that you've done before in the past? We'll do them. So the very example of going through the dip of the Red Sea, parting the waters and going across the other side, God delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians, Habakkuk is praying, he's worshiping, and he's saying, God, don't you remember Teron, uh, Timon and Paran, where you delivered us? Do those things again. Do the same thing now. Show your power and your glory. So what we can see is Habakkuk's recipe of getting through the dip is the first thing is to remember. To remember what God has done. And it, actually, as you look through Habakkuk chapter 3, the first 15 verses, which we'll read a little bit later, are about his remembering all of the things that God has done to the Israelites. In fact, through, so much throughout Scripture, in, in, the, in the Hebrew Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, it's so much of just telling the next generation, remind the people of what God has done. Because generations would come, and they would forget. They would forget about what God did to their fathers. They would do, and they would forget about what God delivered their, their, their forefathers and their foremothers and their grandfathers and their grandmothers and their great-grandfathers and their great-grandmothers because they failed to tell the story of God's faithfulness. And so the step one for us when we're going through this dip of crisis is to remember, remind ourselves of the faithfulness of God. And this is why I think house church is important. This is why community is important. Because in this group, you get to hear the stories of God's faithfulness. When one person is struggling through parenting or through marriage or through job or through life or through church, another person can share and say, I remember when I went through the same, but God was faithful. And it's a remembering of God's faithfulness. So we tell the story of God's faithfulness. You know, Elder Sam gets up here and he's talking about these windows and he's talking about the way you see, we only see the windows. We see the light coming in. But Stan says this one line. He says, this is 10 years in the making. We, we had to go through the dip of, I, don't, I mean, I don't know the circumstances. I don't want to preach the windows, right? But I'm saying, like, there's a process that happened. We show up and go, oh, look at the light. Great. This is wonderful. But we tell the story and say, actually, that, that took a while. It took some votes. It took some money. It took some budgeting. I don't know, right? But ask Stan during lunch. But there, there's, a, there's a story of God's faithfulness that we must remember. We, we should remember specifically the ways that God has blessed us. So if we as a church are feeling discouraged, if you are a member of this church and are feeling discouraged because of the fact that we have, we, we have no pastor, we need, to we need to remember God's faithfulness. We need to tell the story. Those of you who have been here through this before, tell the story of God's faithfulness. Remind us of God's faithfulness so that we can remember who God is. If you in your spiritual life, as you're journeying with God and you just, you feel distant from God, you feel a, a, um, a distance from the intimacy of your relationship with God, I would encourage you to remember God's faithfulness to you in your life. And when I say, like, I would challenge it, like, I'm actually saying, like, if this is important to you, 
I would actually open up a, a, a notebook or a journal and write it down. Or if you like Excel, like <laughs> put it in an Excel sheet and like actually write it down. Count your blessings, like actually count them numerically. And be reminded, remember the goodness of God. If you're going through a dip right now in your life, remember the faithfulness of God. Remembering what God does in our situation, remembering who God is in our difficult situation doesn't actually change our situation, right? We're going through a difficult time in the church. We're going through a difficult time in our marriage, in our job, in our life, in our relationship. But remembering who God is doesn't actually change any of the things and specifics about the situation that we're in, right? But yet it can make so much of a difference because it changes our perspective on the situation. We can very easily get lost in the myopic view of our situation and say, this is the most important, the only thing that is important to me. But then we step back and remember the faithfulness of God and it changes our perspective. Where something that is something so important, so heavy, can suddenly become something that we say, you know what, this is something that is within God's grasp. This is something that God can handle. And so even though remembering God's faithfulness doesn't change the circumstances of our situation, it can change our perspective in the situation. And so this is how Habakkuk begins to go through the dip. He remembers God's faithfulness. And this is his response in verses 16 through 18. He says, I heard of your faithfulness and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet... I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field, fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in, all the, in, in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He says, I will wait patiently. And even though there are no figs, no grapes, no olives, no food, no sheep, no cattle, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Habakkuk is specifically calling out the fact that even if the situation does not change, that does not change God's worthiness to be praised. Even though my situation does not change, that does not change God's worthiness to be worshipped. We will remember all that God has done, but we will rejoice in who God is. So we remember the character of God and then we rejoice in the character of God, even though our circumstances do not change. So we remember, that doesn't change our circumstances, it changes our perspective. And then we rejoice, doesn't change our circumstances, yet it changes our attitude amidst whatever circumstance you're going through. God is still worthy of worship. We're reminded of the disciples where they are faced in this dip, in this crisis of belief where they say, are you gonna leave me as well? Once all of the multitudes were leaving Jesus and Jesus says, you know, are you, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And, 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 and the disciples say, well, where else are we gonna go? To whom shall we go? Where else are we gonna go? In other words, I mean, it's not great, but we have no alternative. We know who you are. Circumstances are not great. I, 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 this is not necessarily the best and most joyful time, but I know who you are. To whom shall we go? Where, what other alternative do we have? So you may be in a situation in your life where you feel disappointed by God. You feel disappointed by the church. You feel disappointed from one another. But my question is, to whom shall you go? Like, is that enough? 
for you to reject God altogether? Or are you say, able to say, I know who God is. I know the goodness of God, and I'm going to go through this dip because all I know is that God is worthy, and that's enough for me to hold on. Yet I will rejoice. Reminds me of another passage in Scripture from Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. It's, so the second step is rejoice. And then it reminds me of Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 18 through 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this was the case, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Daniel's friends were being thrown into a fiery furnace. And they said, we have faith that God can deliver us. And then verse 18, it says, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Daniel's friends had the faith and belief that God could deliver them from the fire, but they had the discipline and faith to say, but even if not, even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to turn away from God. Despite my circumstances, even if we aren't delivered, even if there are no figs and no olives and no crops and no food and no sheep and no cattle, doesn't change the worthiness of God to be worshipped. This phrase in Daniel uh, chapter 3, that phrase, but if not, there's a story that is told about how it became a rallying cry in World War II with the British forces who were trapped in Dunkirk. It was British and French forces that were being trapped by the German invasion. It was the, the, the f sort of push to the sea for the, for the Germans. And um, so the Germans had basically surrounded about, you know, 450,000 uh, British and French um, uh, soldiers uh, at Dunkirk. And this is a movie that you've probably seen about this. Um, but what ended up happening was that this, this phrase here in Daniel, which says, but if not, was something that was um, articulated to the, by the commander of the British forces, it's told. That even if we would, you know, we will fight and to preserve our lives until we are rescued, but even if not, we will fight to the death. And the story of Dunkirk is told that, that hundreds of thousands, 338,000 of those soldiers were rescued. And the story of how they were rescued is actually part of this movie, Dunkirk, if you haven't seen the movie. It's worth watching, even though you know that you know, they, many of them get saved. It's actually the, the process through which they were saved that is, I think, actually very uh, worthwhile in watching. But it's this idea of but if not, even if not, there's a, there's, a, there's a faith aspect of it, that even if not, even though there are no figs or crop or sheep or cattle, God is still worthy to be praised. So Habakkuk remembers and he rejoices. And lastly, it says in verse 19, it says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the, the feet of a deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. In other words, he relies upon God. Habakkuk remembers, he rejoices in who God is, and he relies upon God. He says, it, you will raise me to the heights. The sovereign Lord is my strength. I will put my trust in God, and he will take me to the heights. And that's the, that's the picture of that dip, right? You go through the dip, you remember, you rejoice, and we rely as God brings us to the heights, makes my feet like the feet of a deer who enable me to tread on to the heights. If you live in northern New Jersey, you know about deer. Um, they, they, they live in our yards, and you build fences. And did you know that you have to build, a, for your fence to keep out deer, you have to build them at least six feet high. Six feet high to keep the deer out, meaning anything less than six feet, the deer, it won't stop them. Right? This is the picture of a deer treading on the heights. It's, it's leaping the heights of which a deer can jump. This is the picture of us 
if we hold on to God, if we, we rely upon God. You remember the story of Habakkuk as we first started. The name Habakkuk actually means to wrestle, to grab hold, to grapple. So you see in picture in chapter 1, this picture of Habakkuk wrestling with God and saying, God, why is this happening? And God's response, and he's wrestling with the explanation. He's wrestling with God's, you know, um, uh, his answer. But we see by the end of chapter 3, it's moved from wrestling to embracing, to grabbing hold and not letting go, to saying, I have no other place to turn except to you. And so the rally cry of, yet I will, yet, even despite, even though there is no fig or crop or olive or, or sheep or cattle, no food, yet I will rejoice, yet I will wait, yet I will embrace, yet I will Habakkuk to God. We remember what he has done. We rejoice at who he is, and we rely on what he can do. Wherever you're at in your life, whatever situation you may find yourself personally, professionally, as a church, remember Rejoice, remember what God has done, rejoice at who he is, and rely at what he can do. Now, I want to end with something that I think we've done before, and that is to get the whole story of Habakkuk in one sitting. So what I I like to do when it's a short enough book or passage or letter is to actually read the whole thing together. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. And so there is power in the public reading of Scripture. So I'm going to read for us the three chapters of Habakkuk to give us a broad picture of the message that God may be trying to tell us to. And I encourage you that as you hear this, um, it's in the message translation, so it should be a little bit more uh, easy to follow. I encourage you to remember the themes of faith in the dip and grabbing hold and embracing to God. Habakkuk chapters 1 through 3. The problem is God gave Habakkuk to see it. God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder, police, before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look on evil, stare trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out. Quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. Look around at the godless nations. Look long and hard. Brace yourself for a shock. Something's about to take place, and you're going to find it hard to believe. I'm about to raise up the Babylonians to punish you. Babylonians, fierce and ferocious, world-conquering Babylon, grabbing up nations right and left, a dreadful and terrible people making up its own rules as it goes. Their horses run like the wind, attack like bloodthirsty wolves, a stampede of galloping horses thunders out of nowhere. They descend like vultures, circling, circling in on carrion. They're out to kill. Death is on their minds. They collect victims like squirrels gathering nuts. They mock kings, poke fun at generals, spit on forts, and leave them in the dust. They'll all be blown away by the wind. Brazen in sin, they called strength their God, God, you're from eternity, aren't you? Holy God, aren't, we aren't going to die, are we? God, you chose Babylonians for your judgment work? Rock solid God, you gave them the job of discipline? But you can't be serious, you can't condone evil. So why don't you do something about this? Why are you silent now? This outrage, evil men swallow up the righteous and you stand around and watch you're treating men and women as so many fish in the ocean, swimming without direction, swimming but not getting anywhere. Then this evil Babylonian arrives and goes fishing. He pulls in a good catch. He catches his limit and fills his creel a good day of fishing. He's happy. He praises his rod and reel, piles his fishing gear onto the altar and worships it. It's made his day and he's going to eat well tonight. Are you going to let this go on and on? Will you let this Babylonian fisherman fish like a weekend angler, killing 
people as if they're nothing but fish? What's God gonna say to my questions? I'm braced for the worst. I'll climb to the lookout tower and scan the horizons. I'll wait to see what God says, how he'll answer my complaint. And then God answered, write this. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. This vision message is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait, and it doesn't lie. If it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way. It will come right on time. Look at that man bloated by self-importance, full of himself but soul empty. But the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive, really alive. Note well, money deceives. The arrogant rich don't last. They are more hungry for wealth than the grave is for cadavers. Like death, they always want more, but the more they get is dead bodies. They are cemeteries filled with dead nations, graveyards filled with corpses. Don't give people like this a second thought. Soon the whole world will be taunting them. Who do you think you are getting rich by stealing and extortion? How long do you think you can get away with this? Indeed, how long before your victims wake up, stand up, and make you the victim? You've plundered nation after nation. Now you'll get a taste of your own medicine. All the survivors are out to plunder you, a payback for all your uh, murders and massacres. Who do you think you are? Recklessly grabbing and looting, living it up, acting like the king of the mountains, acting above it all, above trials and troubles. You've engineered the ruin of your own house. In ruining others, you've ruined yourself. You've undermined your foundations, rotted out your own soul. The bricks of your house will speak up and accuse you. The woodwork will step forward with evidence. Who do you think you are building a town by murder, a city with crime? Don't you know that God of the angel armies makes sure nothing comes out of that but ashes? Make sure the harder you work at that kind of thing, the less you are. Meanwhile, the earth is filled up with awareness of God's glory as the waters cover the sea. Who do you think you are inviting your neighbors to your drunken parties, giving them too much to drink, roping them into your sexual orgies? You thought you were having the time of your life wrong. It's a time of disgrace. All the time you were drinking, you were drinking from the cup of God's wrath. You'll wake up holding your throbbing head, hung over, hung over from Lebanon violence, hung over from animal massacres, hung over from murder and mayhem, from multiple violations of place and people. What's the use of a carved God so skillfully carved by its sculptor? What good is a fancy cast God when all it tells is lies? What sense does it make to be a pious God maker who makes gods that can't even talk? Who do you think you are saying to a stick of wood, wake up, or to a dumb stone, get up? Can they teach you anything about anything? There's nothing to them but surface. There's nothing on the inside. But oh, God is in his holy temple. Quiet, everyone, a holy silence. Listen, a prayer of prophet Habakkuk with orchestra. God, I've heard what our ancestors say about you. And I'm stopped in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them. And as you bring judgment, as you surely must, remember mercy. God's on his way again retracing his old salvation route, coming up from the south through Timon, the holy one from Mount Paran. Skies, skies are blazing with his splendor, his praises sounding through the earth, his clouds, brightness through like dawn, exploding, spreading, forked lightning shooting from his hand. What power hidden in that fist? Plague marches before him, pestilence at his heels. He stops, he shakes earth, he looks around, nations tremble. The age-old mountain falls to pieces. Ancient hills collapse like a spent balloon. The paths God takes are older than the oldest mountains and hills. I saw everyone worried in a panic. Old wilderness adversaries, Kushan and Midian, were terrified, hoping he wouldn't notice them. God, is it river you're mad at? Angry at old river. Were you raging at sea when you rode horse and chariot through to salvation? You unfurled your bow and let loose a volley of arrows. You split earth with rivers. Mountains saw what was coming. They twisted in pain. Floodwaters poured in. 
Oceans roared and reared huge waves. Sun and moon stopped in their tracks. Your flashing arrows stopped them. Your lightning strike spears impaled them. Angry, you stomped through earth. Furious, you crushed the godless nations. You were out to save your people, to save your specifically chosen people. You beat the suffering out of King Wicked, stripped him naked from head to toe, set his severed head on his own spear and blew away his army. Scattered, they were to the four winds and ended up like food for the sharks. You galloped through the sea on your horses, racing on the crests of the waves. When I heard it, my stomach did flips. I stammered and stuttered. My bones turned to water. I staggered and stumbled. I sit and wait for doomsday to descend on our attackers. Though the cherry trees don't blossom, and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to God, my Savior, to my Savior God, counting on God's rule to prevail. I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I am king of the mountain. Let's pray. Let's just take a moment and just respond to the Lord and be reminded of God's faithfulness. And if today, as you are thinking about God's faithfulness, as you're thinking about God's character and what he has done, look no further than the cross. Look no further than what Jesus has done, has done for us on the cross. And what we do as an act of communion as a church is a reminder of that. It's to remember and it is to rejoice and it's a reminder for us to rely upon the faithfulness and goodness of God. Despite our circumstances, despite our situation, we rely upon God. God, we are grateful for your goodness, for your faithfulness, your power, the ability for you to strike terror in our enemies, God, gives us comfort that despite whatever situation we may be in, you still are worthy of worship. You are still worthy of praise. You are still worthy of our lives. So God, do them again. Do your acts of mercy. Do your acts of justice. Do them again in our day. And until that day, God, we will, Habakkuk, we will embrace and walk with you. Church, every uh, month, first Sunday, we gather together to break bread and drink the same cup. Uh, and we do this because... Christ Jesus has commended us and it signifies the unity uh, of the body and we are reminded of his saving grace through the bread and the cup uh, this time uh, will you join me in prayer uh, one more time to prepare our hearts for communion Lord God we thank you that you are our God who loves us so much that you have sent your only begotten son, Christ Jesus, for us. And through your son, Jesus, all of our guilt and shame, all of our sin have been taken away. You alone have paid the great price. Lord, we thank you for that grace, that amazing grace. Lord, this table reminds us of that very grace, this table reminds us of your great mercy. And this table reminds us of the unity that you have bestowed upon your church. Lord, before we take the bread and the cup, we confess our hearts, especially our sins before you. We ask that your spirit continue to guide us and lead us and sanctify us daily. 
though we may fall short, we ask that your spirit encourage us and strengthen us, O oh God. We thank you for this table. Be with us now as we break bread and drink the same cup together. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This table is Lord's table, and he invites those who place their faith and trust in him. Here now the word of institution of the Holy Supper. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered his disciples. He took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink. This is a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, church, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. The table is now ready, so we invite those who have been baptized or confirmed that you make your way up here to receive your bread and the cup. Please, uh, with our uh, welcoming team's guidance, please make your way up here to the middle aisle. Uh, the one instruction is that you take the bread and uh, you wait until everyone receives and then we will take the bread together and for the drink we will uh, drink separately individually Just this time, let us take the bread together. The body of Christ, give it for us. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for us. This time, if you're able, let us all stand and cite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Amen. May I sing your hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. I'll leave you with a blessing of the reminder that we get from Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud and though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. Thank you.